um, just to double check. It does say that we are streaming live now, but he'll give the final light and then we'll get started. Good, yeah, we're live. Thank you. Well, welcome. Bienvenidos, bonjour. Uh, what a pleasure to be with you here on uh, what for me is Sunday afternoon in the States. Um, but I welcome all of you from wherever you are joining us to view today's Creating Voices live poetry open mic. Um, I'm Sandy Yanone. I'll be your host today of Cultivating Voices Live Poetry. I'm also author of Oats for Women from Salmon Poetry. And you're here today for our first live open mic of 21 to start our second season. Um, I'm actually joining you from my new bedroom in my parents' new house in Sabre, Connecticut that I've been helping them move into. Um, and it's this town is where I grew up and frankly, where I started to write poetry in high school. So it does have a little special shimmer to me to be able to join you um, from this location. Although I'm normally joining you from Olympia, Washington on the West Coast. Well, Cultivating Voices Live Poetry is a Facebook group and weekly reading series that was started last March in response to the pandemic. And we keep persisting in our response week after week. We have a incredible line, an incredible schedule of poets um, and exceptional poetry coming up every week during 2021. All, and we alternate with a live open mic as we have today and our very popular new books showcase readings. Um, we had our first last week. Well, a little bit of each of our hour one readers and in our first live open mic for 2021. The reminder to check out readers' bios on our group and our event pages for more information about how to purchase um, their books if they if they have book their books swag to support them um, and anything related to their presses. I do like to encourage folks um, to if you can and have the resources at least try to buy one book of poetry today from one of our readers to um, support the endeavor of keeping poetry um, alive and well during the pandemic. I wanna thank those of you who are joining us live here in our Zoom Poetry Studio. We have a really great um, robust, as I said, audience today. And those of you watching us live on Facebook on our group page. In both venues, feel free to today to give these eight fabulous poets your love and support. Um, I'll be introducing our first hour's poets now, and I'll be back at the top of the hour to introduce you to our hour two poets. So first, who will be reading today? And it is my pleasure to welcome from uh, Kolkata, India, where it is very, very early in the morning, Dr. Medha Bhattacharya who is an assistant professor at the Department of Basic Science and Humanities, otherwise known as the English Department, at the Bengal Institute of Technology in Kolkata, India. Her book published in 2020 by Routledge in London and New York, titled Rabindranath Tagore's Santin Niketan Essays, Religion, Spirituality, and philosophy. Her poems feature in international anthologies and journals, and she has obtained the prestigious award for outstanding contribution to teaching, learning, and research from Malana Abul Kalam Azad University of Technology, formerly known as WBUT in West Bengal, India. She has been invited to deliver talks in India and abroad, including 
at Harvard University, Princeton University, and the University of Pennsylvania. And it is what a pleasure to welcome her back to Cultivating Voices Lab Poetry. Our second reader will be Amit Dahia Badsha, who has been an organic farmer, communication planner, outdoor survival instructor, skills of observation trainer, and for the last 20 years, a full-time work poet with 20 collections to his credit. In 2004, the Senior Environment Corps Center in the park, Germantown, Philadelphia, designated Amit, their poet laureate. Amit is the founder of Delhi Poetry, a movement that hosted one poetry reading a day for 10 years. And his signature poem, The Last Will of the Tiger, featured as a film on NBTV, helped raise a half million dollars to help save the tiger. What, what a, what a, what an, what an extraordinary contribution to the ecosystem and to save the animals. Well, from one of my favorite places, literally in the world, our next poet, um, and one of my favorite hosts of poetry. I admire Siobhan Potter so much. Uh, Siobhan Potter works as an artist, writer, psychotherapist. Her practice documents experience and Siobhan has published in written and oral form and is the first living Irish poet to be included in the Voetica Oral Poetry Archive. Siobhan founded and co-curates Not the Time to be Silent, an online arts response to social distancing. It is an exceptional, exceptional venue for poetry and I encourage you all to try to join in some Thursday and it is a real pleasure to have you here on the program day and I hope you won't be too critical of my hosting because you're the hostess with the mostest, you endure. <laughs> And to round out our one, uh, another of my um, dear, another dear, dear member of Cultivating Voices Live Poetry. You've seen her read a number of times with us in the past year. And it is always a pleasure to welcome Amy Berry, who writes poems and short stories and is published in anthologies, journals, and press and e-zines globally, including in Southward, the Sunday Tribune, the Blue Nib, Paris Lit Up. Her poems have been translated into many languages, including Spanish, Turkish, Persian, French, and Italian. A nominee for the Pushcart 2021 Poetry Prize, Amy also was long listed for the 2021 Trim Poetry Competition. And she's also been featured in the RTE Radio 1 Extra in Reverberation Series 2 in November of 2018 and has performed her work in Ireland and internationally, including Italy, China, and Turkey. Well, that's just our one, folks. So would you please welcome our our one poets and Medva, take it away. can unmute. <laughs> there you go. Oh, she is off. There you are. Great. You're good to go.
I'm not hearing you yet. I wonder if your volume, maybe if you're you're not muted. So, Mad Hot, wait. This is Don. It, can you hear me? If you can, could you nod your head? Um, I think maybe if you stop recording for a moment, let's see if we can hear you. Give it a moment and then and then try again. If if we if it doesn't work, you might it might be worthwhile to disconnect and reconnect. Some okay. it, it looks like your your connection got confused. Okay. How about we move on to Amit and we'll have Amit start and we'll come back to Medha. Like um, and see if he sh if she can reconnect. Am I okay with? And we'll check in with Medha right after Amit reads. This is why it's live poetry, friends. <laughs> Hi, can you hear me? Perfectly. Uh, my first offering is a poem called Delhi, uh, a very fine Indian poet called Nida Fazli, who passed uh, two years ago, said to me that for something, for a piece of writing to qualify as poetry, it needs to stem deeply from your own experience. Otherwise, it's prose. And um, so the poems that I'm going to do with you today are poems that come from my life uh, and the transition I made from a small village in North India to Delhi. My first offering is a poem called Delhi. Where every twisting, turning, winding lane tells growing tales of mystery where any piece of fallen stone could be a piece of broken history, where empires forged in blood and steel have stayed as saffron scent on kitchen air, where the paradox is everywhere of an imperial city with the flavors of a village, where a pavement dweller dares to tell you what your life holds and his caged parrot picks your chances where a street urchin steals only the tune from your car stereo and dances, where there is still shade enough for shadeful glances, where a true love still waits to be found with just two lines of good poetry, Delhi. Thank you. You know, when you come from a small village to Delhi, there are, there are two things that strike you very deeply. One is people doing performing a very strange activity you don't see in rural India, and it's called begging. But the word for it in Buddhism is bhiksha. And it is a very important part of your spiritual development if you're a Buddhist monk, for instance. If you're hungry four times a day, you need to go out and beg one handful of food each time. Because in the begging of that food, you surrender your ego. And it's only when you've completely lost your ego that you can even begin the journey of becoming a true Buddhist. But you see begging across Delhi, and it's quite strange if you're coming from a small village of, you know, in, in Northwest India. So this poem explores the concept of begging and what it means. You see, in a developed country on a Saturday, you, would, you could go to a, a shrink and for $75 in 30 minutes, lie back on a couch and get rid of your guilt. In India, you make money hand over fist all day long. And on Friday evening, when you're going home at the traffic light, a person called a beggar comes up to you and for one shining coin equal to about 10 cents, he wishes you that you would have the life of a king, that your children would be kings and queens and that they would rule 
and all your guilt over all the money that you've been making all week goes off for, for 10 cents. This poem is called Bhiksha. I do not become a beggar when I invite you to open the granary of your heart. You do not become a giver and I am no taker when a small handful of food changes hands. Instead, when your fingers curl into a small cup of giving and my hand falls into a large bowl of receiving, we form a yantra of sacred sharing, a perfect mudra of two imperfect parts. When a single rice grain performs that long journey between us, it ends the famine between our souls, these empty, aching, and hungry hearts. Um, thank you. One of the things that you see in Delhi is this beautiful script, calligraphic script called Urdu. Urdu is an Indian language, but it uses the Arabic script and it's an astonishing thing if you come from where I am because my language doesn't have a script. And I know what it means uh, to not have a script because then other people will write your history in a way that suits them. So this is Urdu, one of the courtliest and sweetest languages for poetry. It uses the Arabic script. So it could just, the poem could just as well be called Arabic. Um, but unlike Arabic, which is quite harsh and, you know, got rid at times in its cadence, Urdu is beautiful and sonorous because it has elements of Persian and Hindustani in it. Urdu. Night stars impaled on black buck horns. Night stars impaled on black buck horns, the crescent curve of moon, sand dune, the sharpness of acacia thorns. Of these, the script of Urdu born. Oh, how the marsh reed celebrates every drop of wetness in the ink. Long flowing strokes and hesitates to contemplate and pause to think. They say that wisdom is the journey's wage upon the ivory prayer bead trail of vanished herds. They say that wisdom is the journey's wage upon the ivory prayer bead trail of vanished herds. The pen caravans across the desert page, bearing the fruit and shade of sacred words. Um, my parents were both freedom fighters, and my friends like to say that there ought to be a law against two freedom fighters marrying each other, because then this is what you get, you know, uh, a maverick poet who insists on breaking all the rules of poetry, refuses to conform to form, and um, basically lives out, outside the circle of academic influence in poetry. So this poem is dedicated to my parents. And it's relevant in the light of what we've just experienced in the US as well. The poem's called Who's Republic? One by one, turn by turn, the cat, and the bat and the crow and the rat have taken my city. One by one, turn by turn, the cat and the bat and the crow and the rat have taken my city. Insomnia rules the night and fear of the siren and the flasher rules the day. And that broad promised highway into the future is taken up by the motorcades of the politician, the shaker and mover, the power broker, the wheeler dealer, the spin doctor, the troubleshooter leaving only a tiny lane for we the people to navigate our way precariously ahead. In 70 years, we the people have been broken and tamed. The have-nots have been bought with false promises. The haves have been bought with tax loopholes. The middle class is ritually slitting its own throat upon the sharp edge of the credit card. And the last of the freedom fighters <sighs> are breathing bravely on life support systems. And we, the children of the freedom fighters, were doubly damned and doubly doomed. For we have not learned to look the other way or turn the other cheek. So shoot me thrice when my time comes. 
once in the gut to balance the pain of so much hunger and unequal living, once in the heart, for it was a fickle thing and always too easily broken, and once in the head, for always thinking the impossible and dying to make it happen. Um, I caught my, <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I caught my first trout when I came to um, to the US and uh, this poem is called The Trout. Beneath the weeping, trembling willow tree beside the burbling brook, the waters sing their song to me. I reach for pen and book. But the strong of this, the song of the stream is hard to sing in open verse or sonnet. In rhyme and line, you cannot cast enough light upon it. But still, in even song and half twilight, I cast and take a trout in flight. We pant and struggle in the dying light till life and death turns misty night. The stream, it says one thing at last, I think I understand. Eternal is ephemeral when nature is at hand. My, my last offering is a poem called The Last Will of the Tiger. Um, you know, <laughs> I believe that we will not be able to save the tiger, that uh, we are cursed to ex be witness to its uh, extinction in our own lifetimes. Uh, do I have three minutes? Uh, Sandy, to finish this poem? Great. So we are incapable of saving the tiger because we refuse to return rice land, rice fields to wetland. We refuse to return some wheat and sugar cane acreage to grassy plains and meadows. So the deer, a creature of flight, is forced to go into the forest where even the village dogs uh, dine on venison like kings every night which is responsible for the extinction of the tiger. If we return the acreage, some acreage, to wetland and meadows, then the wetland will save the meadows, the grassy plains and meadows will save the deer, and the deer will save the tiger. It's not your job or mine. We have nothing to do that. And so before the last tiger goes into extinction, as God's great creature, he will write his will. And this poem is called The Last Will of the Tiger. When you have stolen my skin from my entity and removed the roar from my life, O oh, hunter, wield the skinning knife with some grace, a little skill. For I too have hunted and killed many, many, many times, but every kill was a prayer and praise of the Creator. My movements were always quick, clean, merciful. Such is the way of true believers. Do you now, hunter, slice, slash, and cut clean? I pray only that you leave no part of me behind to be eaten by the jackal and the hyena. For I have ruled this forest on behalf of the creator himself. And there is no honor in a king becoming carrion. So take the sacred color from my coat, send it back to the maker of sunsets. Take the darkness of my stripe and return it to the shadow and the undergrowth and the night, for that is where it was obtained. Take the white from the fur of my belly and send it back to a new ice age that it returned to avenge me. Send my roar back to my maker that he fills the heavens with my rage at this shabby end for a true king ordained by God himself. Send my claws to the young of the rich and the high-born to save them from their own nightmares. Send my teeth to Tibet that their aspirations for freedom find new teeth. Send my bones to China that they find a cure for the fear that builds such great walls. Send my fat to Singapore that they learn to make a bomb that is mine, not merely a name. 
send my shit to the alchemists, for that is the only substance they have not yet tried in their efforts to invent gold. Give my entrails to whoever shall have them. But hang on to my eyes, you puny murderer that your tribe might know that you did not fell a creature beneath you, that I looked you in the eye and did not flinch when you shot me. Instead, I am turned away, released from the cancer of your footprint. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, it looks like we have you back. Welcome. Go right ahead. Sorry for the technical issue. So am I audible right now? Okay, great, great. Thank yeah. you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for having me here. The poem I'm going to read is I Document. It was written a few days ago, and it goes like this. Every moment of my existence, I document my moments of lonely passion, my moments of wholefulness, the shrieking modulation of hawkers selling their goods, vegetables, fish, flowers, date palm jaggery, buyers of worn out discarded clothes, every conversation that we had every day of those nine months, every emotion, every feeling, everything that could be described or felt, or every moment of security and insecurity Every moment of dreaming and aspiring, I document, just document. Holding on to everything and yet li living in the present, it seems I have lost the woman I saw exactly a year ago. It seems coronavirus, like a science fiction monster, has slowly started eating into her core. What is it? trying to destroy the physical, the emotional, the creative, the intellectual, the spiritual, which, of, which one of these? Or are they all of these? Somehow, sometimes, it fills the solid ground beneath my feet, has been snatched away from me, just as a woman feels while standing over the gigantic cracks of an overwhelming earthquake threatening to swallow her entire existence. Does it feel like Sita? Maybe. Taking willful refuge in Mother Earth, unlike this time, where the woman was caught unawares. I want to break free, forever free. The shackles of any bond is not for me. I tried, tried hard. I need to be myself, search for myself, seek myself out amidst the crowd of undefined, confused identities thrust upon me by others. Go on a quest to find that woman, hold on to that woman from a year back, rising like the phoenix from the wispy ashes of coronavirus with hood higher than before emerging, a stronger woman, a more forceful woman, a fierce woman who can hold on to this strange post new normal world with a grinding ability to cope. Life must always go on like a projectile pulling backwards only to be propelled at a higher force. The need is to go faster, faster than anything else never to look back at the dead ashes of the past, left behind in a pit of illustrious yet disillusioned history, 
Bury the ashes by smearing dust upon pain and hurt. Discard the garbage in the bin. Tie the black bags with string, a tight knot. Everything leading to a post new normal woman. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the second poem, thank you, um, is about a custom in India. There is a custom of sporting with the sindoor. The sindoor is the red powder which only married women put on. And the custom is called Shidur Khala. On the last day of the festival of the goddess Durga, popularly known as Durga Puja, which we had in October, the counter exclusionism celebration that a South Kolkata festival committee had organized on the last day of the festival, known as Vijaya Dashami, has inspired this poem. And the title is The Two Red Dots. And it goes like this A dot is the middle point, the center, a point from which anything begins. Vijaya Dashami is the day on which a single red dot is put on the forehead of a married woman. In between the eyebrows or just above that point on the forehead, a material manifestation of the third eye. What a metaphor, but is it? How could that bring privileges to only married women and look down upon other women not married? A community of people protested, came up with the double red dots for women on the auspicious day of Vijaya Dashami, an equalizer where the members of the third gender got invited. So did the widows, divorced women, and women never ever married, living up to the true spirit of the occasion. Thank you. The next poem is called Kali. Kali is a goddess in India and we celebrate the Diwali. So Diwali is very famous everywhere and uh, it is worship of Kali. So my poem goes like this. Kali, a word denoting power, love, bhakti, the name of an extremely powerful goddess the destroyer of, an, of all evil forces, a term of empowerment for all in whom the fiercely feminine aspect dominates. In these difficult times of the pandemic, the woman goes an extra mile. She juggles her household activities, work, bringing up children, maintaining her mental health as well as physical. Efficiency is her watchword. In the COVID-19 pandemic, her role is threefold more. Maintaining the home and workplace and shuffling within the space in between the two effectively. She is the Kali, the immortal within the mortal, the infinite within the finite, worshipped by all. Thank you. Thank you. The next poem is the festival of Goddess Durga amidst COVID-19. So in 2020, we just went through this whole festival in a very different manner. So it's about this. With COVID-19 infections running rampant, we welcome the Goddess Durga and her family on horseback to her natal home amidst us. Reminds us of the celebration of the triumph of good over evil. Each pandal has its own unique theme. Didn't I just see a pandal having the COVID-19 pandemic as the theme? With the goddess Durga as doctor and the demon Mahishashura as coronavirus? Browsed the pictures of the pandals on the internet and had a virtual tour of them. Unsure of the future, isn't that what a pandemic does? Numbs your thoughts? your dreams and feelings? A pandal hopper 
feeling deprived of the mirth and merrymaking of this unique festival. This year, the festival has been indoors for most of us. Perhaps it is time to look inwards, to introspect for a change. We watched the idiot box, felt really idiotic, but where there is life, there is hope. However, sanitization of the pandals were well taken care of. Precautions were in order. So was social distancing with extreme seriousness. A tough year 2020 has been for all. I can hear the music and mantra chanting via the loudspeakers. We could offer our prayers to the goddess so that she can fight the demon through us, make us strong, may we survive the demonic wrath. While the goddess returns to her heavenly abode with her children, bidding us to fight our own battles and succeed, bidding us not to lose hope. Thank you. Um, do I have a little more time? I just want to read a small poem. Thank you. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. This is titled The Mysterious Lady of the 21st Century. This is worse than a snapshot. A woman, her life, our lives. She is happy with her husband, cute to her boss, a handmaid to her children. A woman who hides her dissatisfaction. She is not to let anyone know of her predicament. Is she the 21st century woman with silence as her watchword? If she breaks it and complains, she is tagged bad. Is she the brand ambassador of a chauvinistic society where women, where working women are seen as available and unmarried women termed too used? One day she dies a natural death, but we know it's a suicide not to live and stand up for her rights, wishes, needs. One word from her and the world would have been a better place for all womankind. Is she that woman, one of our kind? Thank you so much. I go ahead, Sandy. Yeah, I was sure. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Siobhan Potter. Thank you, Sandy and Dan, for cultivating voice, and thanks everyone who's here to read and to listen. Uh, gathering is vital. Um, I'm going to say a little bit. My practice documents uh, experience, and the line of inquiry determines the medium. I work with poetry as a form of mark making. Uh, therefore, it's an extension of drawing. And I'm exploring the intrinsic capacity that both drawing and poetry have for embodied relationship, the poet and poetic body as the mediator between the divine and the consciousness, self and other. Other in the, the, in the sense of the personal and the transpersonal sense of other. I favor um, oral poetic form uh, because of its allegiance to poetry's function, which is to remember in order to not forget. Poetry midwives the expression of personal and collective unconscious processes, representing the voice of archetypes in order to understand what is happening in the psyche. It does this in relation in the relationship between other poet and listener. Uh, poetry uses the personal to speak of the universal in the spirit of service. I do write poems down and I do read off the page, so I'm not a purist in, in oral form, but I do long for that practice. What I'm going to do is read a selection from one body of work. So this is this is the end of me talking about poetry. Um, they are in order, but they're not necessarily sequential. And there are other parts available online if you if you want to Google, you'll find them in oral form. Each poem retains its individual integrity while it's working within the whole body of work. And as a result, there are no titles. Titles have been used for publishing rather than poetic purpose. Um, Form gives function the capacity to speak for and of itself without need for explanation. It's a matter of getting out of the way. 
So let's see if I have managed to get out of the way and let it be itself. I'm going to set a timer. Um, no timers were mentioned at the beginning on the timer. They made it. Then finding it wrong, put it under the stairs where they fed its hunger with guilt and food seasoned with shame, force feeding it language to silence it, then drip feeding it more. Promised that it could be outside if it left its clothes and its no behind. Collaging the maps they encouraged leaving, it homed like a pigeon from a slaughterhouse. On the first day of the rest of its life, they willed it 30 acres of clarity. The problem was, and always had been, that it was a wrong. The way out is clothed in no, and always will be. Loneliness is not to be trusted. It will insert itself without conscience. I meet mine in the fat poet's wife, his impotence, her loss. Her scorn is of sisterhood, mine is of adipose crawl. I am blessed with a man who lets me have secrets. I keep lonely to myself. There is a smell from the hearth of poems tarnished by desperation, yielding to fire. In the three breaths it takes for you to get to snoring, I watch your face fall backwards through your life to a sleep that threatens to drag me into it. I'm grateful for the hatred snoring brings. 64 years of heart cascading is more than I can do post-orgasm. Breathing, barely. Bed sharing is ridiculous. Bed sharing my bed is ridiculous. Our separate room policy, just that, a policy. I am not leaving this bed, my pillow. My first thought is never to wake you, tell you to go to your own bed. Sleep is precious. Before I start thinking of it, about getting your own pillow to smother you, I Google narcolepsy. If I can't love you, I can at least diagnose you. Abandoned, met contempt and thought he'd arrived. His by and her of. She fed him plate loads, familiar hidden things. The favorite, not leaving while not being there. He thrived on self-doubt. She settled in, believing he would never leave in all of the ways you can believe someone will never leave. Had either seen it coming, he wouldn't have. Abandoned turned abandoner, holding contempt in contempt for shelter. Abandoned sees contempt in town, likes it, walks away. Contempt sees abandoned coming, could care, but won't. She has eaten porridge from the pot for so long she has forgotten that she does it. Her neighbour, out while she eats, reminds her. Pot scraping, rebounding in the walled garden, mortifying. She reaffirms her commitment in the liminality of the kitchen, the last ignominious mouthful soothed by the mocha pot, her second favourite. Despite what they tell you, there are favourites. The porridge pot, his, now spoils of divorce. Her grandmother fed her dog in a saucepan. He had the shed to himself, had himself to himself. He loved that pot. Poetry lacks the capacity to be cavalier and pass by. It's a drive-by connected to landscape in service to its collision potential. The drive-by shooting of the pandemic cyclist, his spit weaponized, collides with bludgeon, a word I never utter. But I saw this and I thought of you and not in a postcard kind of way. Distance tries to happen, passing by. What if someday I stop? 
in frosting it, would we collide less? Would it make any difference or matter? Does any of it, is any of it matter? You stopping to be seduced, drinking green tea, barefoot in a garden to return by haiku. And now, still passing, feeling the passing. I pass. Eat meat and give thanks. Time is coming when the potato will fail again and nobody is going to come for us. When we accept that, we will be free. Lentils, chickpeas and plant-based proteins are not indigenous. We will eat meat like our famine forefathers. And while it's not quite time to decide which of our neighbours or children to eat first, we might throw an eye over this while we have access to clear heads. Although everything dies, some will live as seed carriers. Elect to thrive like the first forms that crawled out of water become mud, rise from this mud changed, understanding there is no right to life. Thriving requires faith. Cast aside, it wastes. Ecological is to be part of something too big to comprehend and to not need to. Fun fact, the virus doesn't care who is vegan or spiritual or a survivor. Soon we will be up on all 10 toes, running in bodies designed to run, driven like the dinosaurs to die in our current iteration. Rest easy, the planet will not die. It will change to rid itself of us. Trying to arrest the death of a species misses the point. Death is as much part of life as life itself, and it's almost here. In time, there will be nothing left to burn but the tires, and burn them we will. Learn how to hunt, eat meat, eat it raw, enjoy the lentils. No one is coming to help us, and nothing is wrong. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you. We'll hear our last for this hour is Amy Berry. You can unmute yourself. Hello, everyone. It's nice to be here in our first live open mic. And uh, thank you for hosting Sandy and to Dawn for your technical assistance. Good to see everyone again. I would like to present a poem which is a really love poem and it was inspired when I was um, when I bought this book Shakespeare in Love in uh, Shakespeare's birthplace um, in um, Stratford-upon-Avon and it's um, called Fiery Passion that was recently published in Geography is Irrelevant by Stella Books Fiery passion. I wish, I wish, I wish. I could bury in finality a, long, a lingering pain deep in the Pacific Ocean. I wish, I wish, I wish. I knelt, pleaded for the frenzy rain to drown my mad thirst and swirling egg for you, for this fiery tempest, inscrutable, irresistible, that shot my heart, had caved my mind, clambered my soul, spiral, stifled every fiber in my body, ingrained like a wild riot of the vainglorious Thorny black rose.
my next poem is a, to dedicate to my brother, a chef, a painter, and a singer. And it's called Seeing Rain. A song like fruit hangs in front of me, whose lyrics fly with the wind, his boyish face to the sea. Days before, on a Skype call, patchy as a Spanish feel, he told me he'd chosen to die before death could choose him first. Do you remember the song I played? He asked to talk of our teenage years. His face had become our father's face. And three days later, clear of voice. His throat carried no air. I'm left to inherit his recipes, his art, his Levi's, his borrowed songs, which I take for myself mumbling. Have you ever seen the rain? My brother loves to sing that song. Have you ever seen the rain? So. And the next one is a poem that's inspired by the waking of Willie Ryan by John Broderick. John Broderick is an Athlone writer from my hometown. So the title is Willie Ryan. He hears the manic laughter of a fly sits up among thistles, remembering the eyes of a red fox lash on his, but he takes no notice. Repeatedly clenches, unclenches his nerve-riddled fist. A gunshot echoes, deafens the silent field. Birds scatter as fox blood glisten, red fur giving itself to the dirt. His will just ended. A black fog drapes. He hears the manic laughter of a fly. The next poem is sometime in on the 8th March 2014, the Malaysian airline flight 370 went missing. It was scheduled to um, arrive in Beijing from Kuala Lumpur. And the MH370 is still a mystery. So my next poem is called Missing. The air around the room hums and stutters the staccato sound of voices. Understanding comes in waves. Rumbles at their weary minds. It first breaks their spirits and breaks their hearts. Then it pokes at every organ and every limb, shaking their bodies. And all, it all comes out in stream of tears cascading down its cheek. A dire time, a difficult time. They miss their love at once, more than words can say. Desperation growing and all together in silence they pray at morning, at noon, and evening. Unknowable fate, a battling riddle of the last shadow cast by MH370. Now the next one is inspired by our difficult moment at the, you know, it's an elderly lady in, in her 80s. It's called with, 
or without. And she tucks the blanket tighter, a fake dahlia floral arrangement still in the shadows on her coffee table. It somehow seems to her a reflection of how her life might close. She holds tight a crochet blanket facing the news, the figures and the closeness of an air blown virus that could be swirling outside her window. The man who bought her the fabric she holds would say, I need to get out for my walks. But he left her years before she expected, apart from photos arranged on a dresser. It was nothing as dramatic as a pandemic that took him, no. It was much more innocuous. The doctor said, it didn't seem too serious. Oh, she had offers of company, but for 30 years, she preferred to leave alone. Now is the one thing she drags for her final hours. But who would visit her at such risk? How long more? She asks herself. And um, do I still have the time? Uh, sorry, Sandy, do I, do I still have time? Yeah, okay. And now I'd like to read a poem, a tribute to my late father. The sand of my father, death is a cruel taunt. I used to hurt a snark beside him as he slept. Remember how he used to chase me to the water's edge, frolic in the waves. I got silly butterflies when he caught me, lifting me high and clear. Always a special necktie to try with his favorite shirt, dabbing cologne on his skin and clothes. He stood in front of the mirror. Do I look okay? When I stood I level, he was gray and bald. Hearing, not as sharp as it once was, but he heard me speak to his doctor. I dreamt of your mother last night. He fell silent for a long moment and gaze at the rain-threatened twilight. We spoke no other word. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amy. And uh, wow, so evocative this evening work. And thank you to our three other poets from our first hour plus. <laughs> uh, we heard from Amit and Redha and Siobhan. And uh, what a great way to open our new year with such four, four distinct voices with such provocative work in a myriad of ways. Thank you to each and every one of you. Well, as if our first four parts couldn't have offered us anything better, uh, we now get to hear from four more exquisite human beings. And let, loose, uh, let me introduce them to you. 
uh, without further without further ado. Just joining us on Cultivating Voices Live for her first reading, but she has another one coming up from her new book, which I'll talk about in a moment, is Martina McGowan. I should say Dr. M Martina McGowan, who is a poet, mission, yeah. public speaker, and activist against social, racial, human, and sexual injustices. Martina is the author of the book, I Am the Rage, a poetic exploration of living inside injustice with a release date just coming up next month from Source Books. And I'm gonna put her contact information in the chat from her bio. Martina will be joining us later this spring for her new book showcase reading from I Am The Rage. And it is um, a tremendous, tremendous collection that I've been able to preview. So I'm so glad to have her here today with us and to hear her later with her new book. It is releasing. Congratulations. Following Martina will be Beatty Man. Beatty Man works within the local South London NHS Trust as a mental health support worker and has been performing on the spoken word scene for Obeyed. He also features on the latest album from the band Alabama Three Feet. I think it's Three Feet. Speedy Man will correct me. I'm so sorry. You'll correct me for the right title when you are on the stage. And welcome you for your debut performance here on Cultivating Voices. Following Beatty Man will be a person who is no stranger to Cultivating Voices Live, joined us many, many times, one of my Salmon Poetry sisters, Bertha Rogers. Bertha Rogers' poems appear in literary and in her poetry collections, including Wild Again, Heart Turned Back, and Sleeper Wake, all from Salmon Poetry, as well as several chapbooks. Her translation of Beowulf was thousand. Her translation of the Anglo-Saxon riddle poems from the Exeter book, Uncommon Creatures was published in 19. And we've had the good, good fortune to be able to hear work from all of those collections here at Cultivating Voices. Bertha, who's co-founded Bright Hill Press and the Literary Center of the Catskills in 1992, the current Poet Laureate of Delaware County, New York. And closing us out today for, for uh, her debut here on Cultivating Voices in our first reading of the new year will be Beth Eisenberg, who hails from Cleveland, Ohio, where she had been writing with a fury and sharing um, her work as a member of the Parkland Poet Society in Alberta, Canada, which is where I had the great pleasure to meet Beth for the first time. Thank you to our Hour Two Poets. We're looking forward to hearing from all of you. And please welcome Martina McGowan. Thank you, Sandra. Thanks, everybody, for the invitation. Uh, this first poem is taken from a recent news item, a um, new but recurring theme in, in our mental health problems. Mental health check. Wrestling with the angels and the demons, I am Jacob, perched on the extension ladder between heaven and hell, struggling to find the middle ground caught between my twin selves of light and darkness. The voices all clamoring for attention inside this tiny chamber holding my brain, unable to distinguish or discern the dialogue, all loudly babbling nonstop, more loudly than the people standing beside me, also trying to instruct me. 
Craving silence, I hear myself screaming into the void, lending my voice to the cacophony, trying to speak above the din. Suddenly, a red rose blossoms from my chest. It punches, then it burns a little, then a lot, then nothing. Thankfully, the inner pandemonium is finally silenced as I fall from my ladder to where? To meet the other dead boys. As life's miseries finally leave my side, as the shadows of hell now creep toward my loved ones, standing there on the steps, fading from my sight, I have no time to say goodbye. Thank you. This next one is called, uh, What If We Were Brave? What if we were brave together and we learned to drink the undrinkable, stood steadfast and assured in the face of the seemingly untenable, could synchronize our emotions to this moment, perfectly pitched and timed, the way our hip bones know how to match the desires of our feet and our hearts when we dance and walk and love? What if we assume that we know where we want to go, knew we would survive any fluttering of ruffled feathers, could inhale deeply to soothe our own unruly hearts? What if we wore memorial stones as pendants, as precious as a string of pearls? Would truth permeate our bones, tamp down our natural acts of self-sabotage? Would our will and backbone support us as we yielded only to our true natures? What if we could translate every occasion of our passing into something we could latch onto and act on rather than worry over? What if we were brave together, like we understood why we have come together to acknowledge that we only have loan of this small sliver of infinity? Would we act more courageously? Could we fight injustice? whether the labels we might attract, or would we still stand awaiting further instructions from the universe and let eternity slip through our fingers again? No, let us be brave together this time. This next one, uh, there is too little time is actually in, in the book. There is too little time to teach our children that there is no after to this ubiquitous feeling that life is but a stream trailing from our bodies almost unseen. There is too little time to spoon feed our children, giving them false hope and false hype while trying to convince ourselves that the world can be full of wonder and fair, and they, but they are not free to hold it. There is too little time to teach our children that the fairy light touch can quickly turn into the bite of policeman's club. There is too little time to teach our children to say I to all that life has to offer and to every passing whim, knowing it will not be offered to them. There is too little time to teach our children to fight to keep their spirits free, the insignificance of hope for tomorrow, managing the lies of apostles and apostates alike, the sweetness of oranges, the tiny moments that make life sweet, the defiance built into their DNA. There is too little time to allow our children to be children. Thank you. Um, this next one, I am the rage is the anchor poem for the book. I am the rage. I am the rage whirling just beneath the surface. I am the dream deferred again. I am the promises needed and repeated, but never kept. I am the air between light and dark, fueling flames that burn, but can neither be consumed nor satisfy its own abiding hunger. I am the glowing embers you continue to poke and prod with meanness that bubbles over onto the streets. I am the ravenous appetite to destroy something, anything. I am the ever-present clanking chains in the belly of the cargo hold, struggling to love myself, a thing you have taught me to loathe. I am the dismal days and the inky skies. I am the niggardly feeling that there is not enough, will never be enough. Money, land, freedom, education, life to satisfy us all. 
I am the outrage that flares every time you say something foolish like, I thought you were already free. I am the disappointment that breathes hot and silent every time I am dismissed, discharged, dishonored, cast aside, counted as worthless or meaningless. I am the melody that lies inside every Negro spiritual that sings praises of diminishing hopes in this life and a brighter, fairer world in the next. I am the mother who wields the belt that cuts both ways, that beats my children in hopes that you will spare their lives. I am the salty tears of anxious mothers, frightened each time her child crosses a threshold, praying for a return that is not guaranteed, like payment for some impossible garnishy on the lives we want for them. I am the furthest point from you, thrashing about in the sea of doom, gasping for air. I am the dark fiber that runs through our shared history that will not allow you to forget, a constant reminder to us both that I can never go home, can never find home. I am the rage running unbridled through the streets. I am the fire this time. I am the rapacious thirst seeking justice for all on these dusky days and obsidian nights. I am the rage that lives within the powder keg of unfulfilled lives awaiting the spark. I am the rage. I am the lost sheep. I am the muted prayer that we will see each other clearly one day. And one final one, um, she's fairly recent, um, my murmur. My people love me and I love them. No, not all of the time, but most of the time we are only human. They are supportive even when my ideas sound a little goofy or they can feel I'm a little scared or in pain. We are a quiet lot, mostly introverts trying to pass for ambiverts doing terrible imitations of extroverts when we must, but we possess heart language. Not many words need pass our lips because we know the deeper meanings of what goes unsaid, sometimes with history. We hold each other's humanity sacred and jump at the slightest slight on their behalf. We bear our souls, cry buckets of ugly tears, curl up into little tiny balls of hurt and fear, and yet can be resurrected by each other with the slightest touch or the simplest act of staying. We each know and hold the truth of who we are and who we are not, what we bring to the table and what we cannot, and we make it work. Importantly, we laugh together. This has become a scarce and precious commodity in a chaotic world and a gift to be cherished. We laugh at each other, laugh at ourselves. Yes, even laugh at the world though, sometimes through bitter tears. These are my people. I know I could not exist without them, nor am I sure I'd want to. These are my flock. These are my murmur in times of confusion, my horde, my pack, my ride or dies, my a spoon coons, my tethers to reality, my lifeboat when I feel defeated or hollow, they are the cement that makes my inner and outer lives one. This is our bond. These are my peeps. These are my loves. And I must tell them more often. Thank you. All right, Beauty Man can unmute and begin your set. To... How do I follow poetry perfection? Um, okay, I'm going to try and cram five minutes, five pieces into the 10 minutes. The first one is a brand new piece. It's called Another Night in Gaza. It's very short. Salt water caresses the skin of a child's anguished face contorted through fear 
and beyond recognition, alone in a world that offers little solace. Her small expressive eyes look upon a vista of terror, broken bodies buried beneath bombed buildings. Nightfall beckons the beginning of another bombardment. Nowhere to hide, no place to shelter, no family to be found, just the unending sound of broken bodies being buried beneath bombed buildings. The thick congealed blood causes her hair to stick to the dust covered head. Salt water caresses the skin of a child's anguished face. Another night in Gaza. Um, the next piece is called um, We Are Many, and it goes like this. <clears throat> I see the streets I walk down that almost look the same until I scratch the surface and then I see the pain. I see the children of friends into poverty are born and zero hour non-contracts have now become the norm. I see the disparity in wealth is now bigger than ever before. Food banks, food vouchers, bailiffs at the door. I see them redeveloping our communities by taking away our homes and breaking down our neighborhoods to the bare bones. I see a hostile environment for the Windrush generation. Yet yeah, my father was one of those invited here to rebuild this nation. I see our beloved NHS, an institution close to our hearts, bled dry by PFIs and being privatized in parts. I see homeless people sleeping in the doorways of this town, yet countless properties are empty, boarded up or shut down. I see mental health and well-being wearing ever thin. The social care cuts mean people struggle with the demons within. I see friends judged fit for work and even though they are sick and then taking their lives because they can't take no more of it. I see a government mm -hmm. that could not be any worse where our lives come second and profits come first. I see that those in power can no longer ignore the voices of the disenfranchised who are screaming, no more. We must all repeat the mantra and hold it to be true that we are many and they are few. Okay, um, the next piece I would like to give, um, it's, um, there's a content warning here, it is about like um, prostitution and, and, and sexual violence and so forth. Um, it was formulated in my head, I was walking home one night and I see a very young looking girl getting into a big posh car and I formulated a story when I got home and wrote this down. Um, it's called Fawn. The misery of her life is etched in her eyes. No closed ties, just a series of goodbyes. What holds her here tears her apart. The haze helps her to forget where did it all start. A misogynist dream, just an object to lie on a punching bag for a pimp with no one to rely on. She moved here to escape the hand she was dealt. Glazed eyes, now arm outstretched, teeth clutching that belt. Sweet relief just moments away, but tomorrow won't be just another day. Long ago, you lost your dreams along with your fight. Ain't no time for fantasies, reality bites. The things that you've endured over the last year are more than anyone should be asked to bear. You fled your hometown to escape the abuse just to find yourself once again being used. Bright lights, big city. This ain't no fairy tale existence, working 14 hour days at the end, left with a pittance, collapsed veins, frail limbs point to the way that you're living battered and bruised, these streets are unforgiving. It was just a few weeks back that she had an abortion. Fight or flight for her, it just ain't an option. She's built up debts, there's only one way she can pay, filthy floors, dirty alleys, selling her soul every day. She thought that he loved her, as he slowly drew her in, weed, coke, then crack, now all she craves is heroin, a continuous cycle, she has nowhere to go to her aggressor, she's just a dirty hoe, features gaunt and skeletal, body close to broken, eyes deep set and voice so softly spoken, and you'll see this girl's story is so fucking obscene, as tomorrow she'll turn 15. Um, the, okay, the next one I'm going to do, um, because it's been like just over a decade since I've been doing spoken word, this was the first piece that I ever performed at an open mic um, in um, October 2010, yeah, and, and it's called One Kiss. Come with me, let's spend some time, we'll correct the world's problems as we sup on a pint. 
walking side by side, clasping hands tight, dancing to forgotten tunes all through the night, making love fully clothed, staring to each other's eyes till the last bell rings and we must go to face the bright sunrise. With paper cups and three bottles of wine, we head to the park to chill and spend time as we lay on the grass and stare at the sky watching cotton wool clouds as they flutter by. I move my hand to hers and our fingers entwine. I turn my head to face hers and she in turn faces mine. As we move closer, our lips touch and an orchestra plays. It's moonlight on a clear night. It's a million sun rays. It's golden colored leaves falling from late autumn trees, the aroma of freshly cut grass and a cool summer's breeze. We lay there still neither moving apart. It seems all the world is motionless except our beating hearts. This is a moment that we'll remember forever. The morning we lay there in the sun and our lips came together. Thank you. Um, the final one I'd like to do is, um, it's called Time and it goes like this. Time is a construct created by humankind, a concept that was put into place that says we will work and pay taxes until we grow old and one day fade away. Time is a construct created by humankind, an unwritten contract that we didn't sign that says we will sleep when it's dark and wake when it's light and work fingers to the bone until we've lost all of our fight. We've lost all of our energy and our memories have faded of the rallying calls of freedom fighters from bygone ages. The distant drums that once called us have now been silenced as our leaders have become obsessed with greed and with violence. Where is all the empathy? Has it been forgotten? Place your hand on my chest. Our hearts beat in tandem. Racism, sexism, homophobia and nationalism. They're all constructs too to create division. We once lived at one with the land, where the great bears walked, where the snakes slithered and the eagles soared, where everything that grew in the field either clothed or housed or nourished or healed. We bartered and traded so that all got fed. The man became greedy and the lush green lands became red. We all became tribal and borders were created. Our ancestors were enslaved and subjugated. We got caught up in a cycle of savage behaviors and forced upon others, those that we called saviors. Diseases and war wiped out whole civilizations and the oppressors created new nations. All love had gone for our fellow man, just thoughts of amassing more gold and more land. You see, time is a construct and they say lest we forget whilst building the aircraft carrier, the drone and the fighter jet, chemical weapons and nanotech to kill, to maim, to spy and to wreck. Are we desensitized to a child washed up on a beach or a drone that kills a kid whilst he plays in the street? And why is one religion seen as better than another and the color of his skin means that he can't be your brother? The polar ice caps are melting, oceans filled with plastic. I cry when I think of all the species that are dying. They continue to raise the rainforest to the ground and the demons that lead us are still climate change denying. You see, time is a construct created by humankind. And we too easily forget the carnage we've left behind. We will continue, they will continue killing and plundering over and over, but we can overcome this madness if we all come together. It's about love, love in its purest form, love of the most basic kind, the love that we once had, but seem to have left behind the type that embraces all the human kinds, that lives within us all and screams, we still have time. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm happy to be back here again, Sandy, this wonderful series that you've put together all this year and still going is wonderful. I loved everybody's reading today. I'm going to read some poems that were inspired, inspired is a bad word uh, for this, but they were inspired by the pandemic, which we're still undergoing. The first one is called Masks. 
Masked, we know only each other's eyes, the words we think lost to mumblings. We are disguised. We are what we see, hair, shoulders, coated arms, the criminals we used to catch. Shielded from each other's truth, what we perceive as smiled greeting is hate, layered, our dearest enemy. One day, the shrouds will untie themselves, leave our battered skulls. We will die into crowded backgrounds, trees at last, happily robbed of leaves. The next one is called Sweetness. It's in three parts. One, when I was a child, I leaned into marches, iced hickories, as if they were walls waiting the warmth of my leafing green body. Those shag barks called to me, promising sweetness after the following falls gathering, wooded fruits clanging into dented buckets, only to be body broken by hammerheads pounding the anvil, anvil's iron skin, meats eked and teased by the hungry pick, then spooned and scaled into sugared squares. Two, there was a woman who in her friendless kitchen baked cakes covered in shiny stiff sugar, a bride's white dress, nut meats pushing through like remembered sins. This was in April, and the cakes called to black ants who walked two by two from the rainy woods to the counter's bounty. The woman cried to be alone. Three, by May, every sweet lay in waiting on tree branches, again promising goodness, and the ants readied their weapons for the wedding to come. Thanks. This next one is called The Road. Every day, the road you choose asks why. You trudge yellow ruts as if you know, but you are lost. The future has vanished, not only for the lame and halt, the ancients, but for those of you whose fingers picked out thoughts from the pages of dreamed books, those written by remembered direction, covenants on every pretty page. Now the trees forget their rooted songs. Brothers and sisters, weeping mothers, stop chanting each other's incised words. The wind taunts torn leaves, broken crowns, but the trees can't hear. Clouds cover you, the dissipating green. Your road ceases. This one is called Star Song, and it has an epigraph from Walt Whitman. I believe a leaf of grass is no less than the journey work of the stars. You paused at the bend in the river, touched the blooms rooted in water's walls. Hope streamed while I turned back, face covered, eyes awash in regret. This was in May, the romance of Orioles shimmered from the threaded purse that kept their babes safe. How can I be sad on such a winged day? How weep while orange birds skim the sky, perform liquid songs. Streets and grasses may burn. Men may usurp birds' jet hoods for dark purposes. But you and I know that the leaf yearns for the new star, that every cloud cushions a trill. This one's called Stumble Down. Thank you. It narrows this ornate staircase, leads us to the last bed, the pillow, tangled sheets of disease. We stumble down, hands sliding, splintered, breaking rails, lost to their own forested origins. This old man petitions air, one last cigarette. He demands immunity from the evil he so freely dispensed, wants to sprint again, arms waving high in easy victory. That woman contends she gave good when requested, never despised her speech-scarred days. Altogether now, lungs begging to retrieve the air they daily squandered. 
plagues, heavy weight, our own feet encased in death's cratered stockings, break the final tread. And the last poem, just, I'm sorry, I thought I had it here. <clears throat> it's called Fall Morning. What can be said about how the earth bears her belly to a fall morning, the way she lifts up her golden paunch? The sun welcomes her rough skin, trees, branches sketch sweet air like leaping creatures. How to grasp the how of lost light, the round how that shrinks into sere gray stems. Who can say the rosy grosbeak's last thought, his fall by the universe he sought, the vast other story in the house's eye? How did his mate mourn his loss? Did she implore him as he left to be happy in the garden they found? Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Well, our final poet today is Beth Eisenberg joining us from Cleveland. Feel free to unmute yourself. Hello. Um, I'm going to read a few poems. Um, the first one doesn't have a title. Actually, I don't think any of them do. I see myself in your character up on the silver screen. Our troubles are different, yet neither one of us fully accepts ourselves. We are both born different. No amount of effort will change who we are. It's hard for us to accept. People think stories are frivolous, fluff, and entertainment. It is so much more. Stories let us see who we are. They teach. Without them, the world would be empty. And this next one I wrote right when the seasons were changing from fall to winter in the beginning of October. There is a crisp breeze in the air. The sky is gray against a backdrop of bright orange, red, and yellow leaves. Another year is almost gone, and another season approaching. I've almost missed it all. The outside has become my only escape. Gone are the trips to the movies, the dinners out, gathering with friends and family for now. Most of my world is virtual. The time spent outdoors, now sacred, a simple walk around the pool or the block. Breathing fresh air takes on a whole new meaning. Life is made of small moments. I don't want to miss any. Uh, there's two more. This one is written in, in uh, a few weeks ago. And in the blank of night, the heater softly humming a lullaby. But sleep isn't coming this night. Not yet. Adrenaline is coursing through my veins. Praise her lights up my synapses. Calm will come and sleep. It's been a fine day. And this is the last one. Voices all around expressing opinions. Scary tales of devils gone rogue that I do not believe. Still the fear rises. What if continue to abound? The world is a safe, scary place to be. But there are no devils roaming around causing chaos. There are humans.
being into human and they are innocent, complete control. The unexplained continues to be an unexplained devil or not. Thank you. Thank you so much, Beth. You said something, well, you said many things, but this is the one I'm going to quote because I think it's absolutely worth repeating and a perfect way to encapsulate what the experience of today has been like for me. And you said in your lines of poetry, stories let us see who we are without, I can't read my own, I can't now, I can't read my own handwriting. Oh my gosh, without, we would be, oh, it was so perfect. Anyway, stories do let us see who we are. And what a display we had today from our poets in our first and second hour. Thank you to our second hour readers. We began with Dr. Martina McGowan. We heard next from South London, BD Man, aka Brian Wilson. I'm going to give you the shout out. Happy anniversary, brother, on that 10th anniversary of that first poem that you shared that with us. We heard from Bertha Rogers, always a pleasure to have you with us as you know I, I love and adore you and joining us from cleveland ohio with all of your humanity was beth eisenberg closing out our first reading of 2020 our first live open mic of 2021 well folks you've been watching cultivating voices live poetry here on in joining us, uh, we're joining you from Zoom on Facebook. A reminder to join us next Sunday for our new books showcase featuring the new books of Shira Dents, Jennifer K. Sweeney, and Jen Koretnik. And two weeks from today will be our next live open mic, always on Sundays, always 12 Pacific, one Mountain, two Central, three Eastern, 8 p.m. Irish UK time. We had a little glitch this week with um, the sign up. I mean, obviously you don't know that, but you saw all these great poets, um, but it came up a little late and there were some folks who had expected to, who were there to sign up. So we're gonna pre-sign up that new, that live open mic two weeks from now, but there still will be some slots available. Um, so come early if you wanna read because um, this week's filled up within an hour. Um, and uh, I look forward to hearing you all. We, uh, just as a bit of a, a bit of the rules of the house, um, we have so many members of Cultivating Voices Live Poetry that we ask that folks read once a month on the live open mic we usually only have two open mics a month anyway. So all of you folks today, I hope you'll come back sometime in February uh, for the next opportunity that you even have to sign up. Well, finally, a reminder for all of you to mark your calendars for February 14th, Sunday, Valentine's Day for our first special event reading of 2021. It's our Laureate Love Fest. We'll be having 11 poet laureate, it's laureate from across the US with special guests from Canada and Ireland, as well as video performances by current US poet laureate, Joy Harjo and um, US poet laureate emeritus, Ted Hooser. That'll be February 14th. Um, and we are Cultivating Voices Live Poetry co-sponsoring that with the Olympia Poetry Network 
and St. Martin's University. Well, as always, and still, I'm Sandy You Know, your host of Cultivating Voices Live Poetry. I'm encouraging everyone this week to be well, take very good care of your beloveds, which means wearing your preferred mask of choice, and keep writing. A very good week to all of you. I hope that you will spend some time tomorrow um, states uh, thinking about social, racial, sexual injustices um, in terms of the uplifting spirit of Dr. Martin Luther King. There are events, um, poetry events that are going on that I'm aware of dedicated to Dr. King's memory and bringing his voice forward. I hope you will spend some time um, with, um, with uh, thinking about what the day means in terms of history and the future. And I also hope dearly, dearly, dearly here in the States, but for really the whole world, because we know the world is watching what goes on here in the United States, that um, we will witness a peaceful transition in power of power to welcome Joe Biden, Kamala Harris, in her historic historic um, uh, oath of office that she'll be taking, and their new administration to the White House. And may all progress well where you live in the world. Namaste, my friends. And thank you for being with us today. We'll see you very soon.